Time for I on the World with Paul Buchanan from 36-parallel.com. Principal and co-founder Paul Buchanan, welcome to the show. Good morning. And uh, today we're talking about um, drones and the use of drones in theatres of war. Um, and in particular, of course, recently the drone attacks, the U.S. drones in, uh, in Pakistan and, uh, and the people that were killed there. That's brought the issue back, back to, the, uh, to the fore. Um, although are drones, I mean, a lot of people are saying, look, it's, it makes people detached from war. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost like computer game war from, from the U.S. Um, and, and we can never be sure that the right people are being killed, Paul. Uh, well, it's there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, and I should just as a as a starter point out that yes, indeed, uh, one of the problems is the depersonalization of warfare when you use these sort of platforms. One of the uh, the unwritten axioms of war is that you place yourself at risk in order to kill the enemy. Mm. And, of course, the use of uh, drones takes the risk factor uh, out in terms of those who are, are, are using that platform. But my understanding is that actually the operators of the drones, the uh, the main base uh, for drone operation that does the targeting of these lethal drones is in Nevada. And apparently they've had a fair amount of post-traumatic stress disorder amongst those operators precisely because they feel that they have an unfair advantage. Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. military is going to quit this program anytime soon. In fact, to the contrary. Uh, but, you know, war is, is a nasty business, and the key is to get a uh, an advantage over your opponent. This is why they, they call them asymmetrical wars. And uh, the drones have turned out to be, uh, I hate to say it this way, but a marvelous platform for uh, commanders uh, because of not only their lethality but uh, their overall utility. And uh, think of it this way. The drones are used uh, uh, according to the rules of the four Ds. Uh, they do the dirty jobs, they do the dangerous jobs, they do the dull jobs, and do all of this dispassionately. So 80% of what drones do uh, is non-lethal. They do uh, a lot of surveillance, a lot of recognizance, and quite frankly, they've been applied in scenarios as different as search and rescue, maritime patrol. I mean, the utility beyond uh, their use as assassination platforms is what's going to keep them in the picture. Uh, in fact, they are the wave of the future. The U.S. Air Force now spends more money training drone operators than it does fighter and bomber pilots combined, and 51 nations have drones. Hmm. So uh, they're here to stay. They're only going to get better in terms of their technological capabilities. And so the question then is, uh, how do you uh, how do you frame or legally frame the deployment of these drones in a way that it respects the laws of war, the civil rights of non-combatants, and that sort of thing. And that's, I think, the big issue for the international community and for individual nation states, uh, such as New Zealand, which is trialing out drones itself, because we don't have a comprehensive legal apparatus, either internationally or nationally, uh, in virtually any country, that uh, offers a clear command and control structure for the operation of drones, particularly when they're used for lethal purposes. Yeah, so, so that is the, is the legal uh, conundrum, the legal problem, that the fact that, um, that killing has to be done in person at the moment, according to law, is, is that what, what's going on? No, no, it's just, it's, it's <clears throat> even for the warriors, uh, the idea that you can kill an opponent uh, seeing him personally but being very far away doesn't sit exactly well. Again, I'm not going to say they're ever going to give this up. Hmm. But even when you do tomahawk strikes, you do long-distance ICBM strikes, you're not seeing the faces of the people you're going to kill. But these drones are very sophisticated. They, uh, you know, they have very high-resolution cameras. They can look into windows from 15,000 feet, uh, they have infrared, they have, you know, they have a lot of technology available to them. 
And so the operators can actually see the faces of the people they're going to kill. Right. And, and, and I, I should point out that this, this is, uh, I don't want to say it's, it's a good thing, but it's not an entirely bad thing. And the reason I say that is that uh, some of the drones being deployed, let's say, for example, the predators that are very much in the news, they can stay at 15,000 feet for five to 10 hours uh, in some cases, uh, some bigger drones like the Global Hawk can stay in the air for almost 24 hours mm. and they can loiter over a target waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting until they get a fix on the people that they, they want to kill off. And so contrary to public opinion, the use of drones has reduced collateral damage of non-combatants rather than increase it. That's a, that's a very generalized misperception, in some cases fueled by propaganda, that the drones somehow are uh, less precise than manned aircraft. Actually, the contrary is true. And I should just tell you the bottom line. Mm. All, all of these platforms depend on human intelligence on the ground. If the intelligence on the ground is faulty, then they can target people who are innocent. And, and that's the conundrum in Afghanistan and Pakistan is that a lot of the, the intelligence that's being fed to the ISAF coalition in the United States is faulty. In some cases, it's deliberately misleading so as to cause civilian casualties. And until uh, these forces have a more robust intelligence capability, on the ground, which is going to be very hard to do in places like North Waziristan, then uh, the possibility of, of gross mistakes occurs. Mm. But drones are an advance, if you will, over manned aircraft in that regard. And so, as, as you say, the technology is amazing and it's only getting better. But really, isn't the technology only as good as the rules of engagement? And, and you, you've been saying that the, the Americans have... Um, you know, a certain standard of rules of engagement. But as you say, there's, there are many countries now with these drones. Are those standards applied everywhere? No, and that's an excellent point because, uh, first of all, the U.S. military's use of drones, which is mostly for surveillance and recognizance, the command and control and communication structure is a lot tighter uh, in the U.S. military, but the CIA operates drones, its paramilitary wing, and uh, let's just say that the command and control within the CIA is a much looser in terms of defining targets uh, and then being quick to pull the trigger. Although for assassination projects, the United States, the, the commander in chief, uh, that is President Obama, has to sign off. And apparently he signed off on several dozen of these targeted assassinations. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. Other countries may have different views of what constitutes a legitimate target. They may have different command and control structures. Think, for example, uh, of the Chinese and the Russians who have very big uh, UAV fleets and who have dissidents. I mean, I think the Russians, for example, when dealing with Chechnyans, uh, may not play as or adhere to the rules that the U.S. military would adhere to. And uh, the, the, the civil rights aspect of this transcends uh, wartime. Right now, we see an increasing use of drones for police functions. And uh, uh, crazy as it may sound, a sheriff's department in Texas has requested permission to purchase drones that can use non-lethal weapons as a form of crowd control. So no longer just for surveillance. Think of the police helicopters that fly around various cities in New Zealand, well, those will eventually be replaced by drones. And those drones will stay up in the air a lot longer. There's a lot uh, less manpower involved, obviously enough. And we have no legal apparatus here in New Zealand to deal with the surveillance aspects, and hopefully we'll never have to deal with a lethal drone flying in our skies. But you're absolutely right. With 51 countries, including some small countries, Singapore has drones, Chile has drones, uh, Indonesia has drones, the Australians have American drones. Uh, this not only is the wave of the future, but it's way ahead of the legal uh, frameworks that should be governing its use, particularly on domestic soil. 
Well, it's certainly an apt subject for um, the final eye on the world because you can't get much more of an eye on the world than a drone um, <laughs> up above us <laughs> looking down on us. Um, Paul, we really appreciate your, um, your, your input to the show and the feature Eye on the World over the past uh, few months. And, uh, and we'll look out for more of you online at 36-parallel.com and also livenews.co.nz. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, all the best of luck to you, Glenn. Cheers.